All right, the timer starts now. My AC is off and it's gonna be 95 degrees. Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. I hope everyone had a nice Memorial Day weekend. When we recorded our late night primary podcast last week, I mentioned that we would follow up with a conversation about public opinion on gun laws, and that is what we're going to do today. As with every mass shooting, there are specifics to the Uvalde school shooting, the shooting at a Buffalo grocery store, and an Orange County church that are unique, and there are other aspects that we've seen before. But what is clear from these tragedies is that they've once again sparked a conversation about gun laws in America. And it remains something of a conundrum that Americans seem to overwhelmingly support stricter gun laws in some cases, yet none are passed. So let's talk about why. Then we're going to debate whether the narrative that the Democratic Party is in disarray is accurate. While in power, the party has struggled to pass its legislative agenda and now faces a difficult midterm environment and uncertainty about who will lead the party at the next presidential election. Lots of trend pieces have been happy to point out those difficulties. So is the party dysfunctional, or is this all par for the course? Here with me to discuss is politics editor Sarah Frostenson. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Galen. Hey, y'all. Also here with us is senior writer Amelia Thompson-DeVoe. Hey, Amelia. Hey, guys. And elections analyst Jeffrey Skelly. Hey, Jeffrey. Hey, Galen. Hey, everybody. All right, before we dive into our topics today, Amelia, I actually have something of a surprise for you. It was sent to me in the mail by one of our listeners, and I got it, I received it a little bit ago, but it was sent to the office, so I didn't receive it right away. Uh, And then I wanted to wait, of course, for you to be on the podcast so that I could share it with the listeners. It is, for people watching the YouTube video, you can see it, it's a, a button. Uh, I was a little confused when a listener sent this. It's an electronic plastic button. I was a little confused. But then I turned it on and pressed it. And this is what it says. Ah, a little partisan. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you remember this, but one time on the podcast, we were talking about partisan signaling and you made that noise that the button just made. And I said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I had a button that said a little partisan <laughs> wee, 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 for whenever uh, there was partisan partisan signaling or partisan playing. And a listener took that seriously and oh uh, sent us a button that says. Ask a little partisan. And there you are. Now we have I'm it. I'm speechless. I'm speechless. <laughs> wow. 10 um, out of 10. Love I it. don't know. Yeah. Do you love it though, Jeff? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I love it's, it. I love this. I think it's great. <laughs> well, we have to actually use it and then we'll, we'll see how much people yeah, I well, it I makes have an it. appearance in today's pod. Mm-hmm. You know, I have it on the desk right here. So, uh, Galen, you might want to just tape it to like your wall or something by where you podcast. <laughs> so you can just quickly go bam every time it's necessary, you know? Um, you know, I love it. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, listener. That's awesome. I, I don't remember the name of the listener. I'm sorry. I don't have the packaging that it came in. I think it's still sitting on my desk at work, but whoever you are, if you're listening right now, thank you. That was, that was very thoughtful. Um, you made our mornings. Okay, let's get to it. And we're going to begin with public opinion on guns. So This podcast has been around for major mass shootings at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, the Parkland school shooting, a shooting on the Las Vegas Strip, and more. And we've had some version of this conversation repeatedly, but in light of recent events, it's worth readdressing. So let's begin with the basics. What does the overall public opinion landscape look like when it comes to stricter gun control laws, Jeffrey? Well, uh, Nathaniel Rakich and I uh, wrote a piece uh, last week for the site sort of looking at uh, polling from civics uh, in particular that asks sort of a a simple version of this question. It's like, do you support stricter gun laws? And uh, for a while now, a very slight plurality or slight majority have have done so. Um, And at times it has really shot up. Uh, even to the high 50s for for short spurts, uh, usually right after uh, a, a you know a mass shooting event, um, and that's sort of what we looked at was that you go through these spurts of having sort of higher support for stricter gun laws, 
and then it tends to revert toward the mean uh, fairly quickly. Um, but on the whole, you know, at least in a vacuum, uh, these polls, uh, that poll, and then uh, long-term polling from Gallup, um, which has regularly shown that um, a majority uh, support stricter gun laws, that there is at least in a vacuum more support for stricter gun laws than not. But as I'm sure we'll talk about, that actually playing out um, doesn't seem to be quite the case. When you say that there's, you know, 50 some percent, a slim majority or a plurality support for stricter gun laws, and then we see on the more specific provisions like universal background checks or even some stricter measures like assault weapons bans that get, you know, sometimes in the 60s, but sometimes all the way up with universal background checks, all the way up to the 80 percent percentage of Americans supporting them. You know, how do we parse that difference that when you ask about specific laws, there's a lot of support. But when you ask the overall question, there's less support. I would venture that some of that's going to connect to partisanship. Um, For instance, uh, with Gallup's version of this question, where for a long time now, there's been a plurality or a majority uh, in support of saying they want the sale of firearms to be more strict, like the laws surrounding them to be more strict. If you look at the partisan breakdown of of who supports things being more strict over time, dating back to about 2000, uh, in 2000 or 2001, uh, about six in 10 Democrats said they wanted things to be more strict and about four in 10 Republicans said that. So not not really a huge gap there. But then in Gallup's most recent polling from 2021, uh, nine in 10 Democrats said that and two in 10 Republicans said that. So basically, like so many things in, in politics, uh, you've seen real partisan sorting on this issue um, to a high degree. So I think what can often happen um, is that in some of those you know really specific things where it's like, oh, do you support universal background checks? You'll get a fair number of Republicans saying they support that. But then when like the push comes to shove on, I don't know, voting on a referendum dealing with it or how people vote for candidates, uh, Republicans are going to generally vote to oppose stricter gun laws and they're going to support candidates who support looser gun laws. Yeah, I'm curious, Sarah and Amelia, what you make of this sort of polling conundrum that the polling when you ask the questions globally about stricter gun laws is a lot closer than when you ask about specific provisions. I, this you know, phenomenon is not new to this podcast, but what do you think is happening in this case? Well, I think part of what's going on and part of what has helped turn this into such a hugely partisan issue over the past few decades mm-hmm. is that you know the, the idea that Democrats are here are trying to take guns away from gun owners has become incredibly successful. Um, And at the same time, the sense that, you know, you have a right to bear arms for your own protection. That's something that the NRA sort of brought into the public consciousness in the 80s and 90s. Um, That's not always how we thought about the Second Amendment. And so I think it's a combination of, you know, sort of fear of, of that specific thing that Democrats are going to take gun owner, going to make it harder for for you, a gun owner, to have a gun or to keep your gun. And, you know, a, a sense that um, this is something that, that Democrats are, are, are prioritizing. But then when you hear something more specific, like background checks, and it's not something that would necessarily, you think, keep you from getting a gun, um, it seems a little bit more palatable, maybe. Um, I mean, I think part of it, too, is just that asking questions about specific policy issues is always just really tricky. You see this on a bunch of other issues, too. Um, I've been writing a lot recently about abortion, and you see it there, where people just have contradictory views, and it's not like they sit around a lot sort of thinking about what what specific policy do I support and what specific policy do I not support. So I think you know, it's kind of intuitive and people are responding, you know, like, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Oh, I don't know. And I think that's part of the reason why when we see referendums coming up where people are actually asked to vote on these policies, there's a lot of room for messaging to change their mind. And again, I think this is just something we see on a wide range of policies. It's not just gun rights. Um, people's views are just not 
you know, incredibly well thought out for obvious reasons. People have busy lives. They're not sitting around thinking about this all the time. Um, and that's certainly what's happened in some of these um, referendums um, and ballot initiatives on gun control. Absolutely. I mean, the Upshot published this piece in 2018 that was look, that you know made the argument that while there is often a wide range of support for various gun control laws, that often erodes once they're the subject of a political debate. Um, and they were citing things that had happened in uh, Maine, where a gun restriction law had failed um, by four points, whereas in Nevada it passed by just a point, um, which was a very narrow margin to win. And I think part of that goes back to to the point that the very ardent base of support for gun rights in the U.S. is concentrated on the Republican side, and it is a very vocal group that is pro-gun rights in this country. And that oftentimes wins the messaging war when it comes down to, you know, which party is going to be trusted on this, um, which voters care about this issue the most. Um, and is one reason, I think, too, why you kind of see there's a broad support for universal background checks. But then when that is actually put into practice, you know, people have to think about the systems they want in place. And I think those who are more you know, energized by an issue tend to, you know, turn out to vote for it and have an outsized effect in kind of shaping that policy. Yeah, those gun restriction laws that you were talking about in Maine and Nevada, there was also one in Washington, were for universal background checks, which issue polling shows suggests that 80% of Americans support. So it was surprising when the measure failed in Maine and barely passed in the other two states. Um, you know, see a seeming 30-point gap between what the polling shows and what voters suggested that they wanted in these referenda. I think the conundrum that oftentimes gets more attention is not even necessarily these ballot initiatives, but hey, if the voters all support these things, why don't politicians act on it in Washington? Is it kind of the same thing at play that Politicians say, oh, okay, you know, issue polling is complicated. And when you ask the global question, because of partisan sorting, things become more 50 50. So we don't really have an incentive to act. Or is there something more going on when it comes to whether or not legislators are legislating on gun control? So, I mean, Ronald Brownstein recently argued in The Atlantic that a lot of this has to do with the makeup of the Senate and how the Senate increasingly favors um, Republican rule, given that Republicans increasingly make up the majority of small rural states in the Senate and they have an outsized voice. And as we were talking about earlier, there is, you know, when it comes to the history and tradition of guns in the U.S., that does lean Republican. It's something that Republican voters, more broadly speaking than Democrats, tend to care a lot about and to feel strongly as part of their identity. Um, so there is definitely, you know, a systemic bias, if you want to call it that, at play in the Senate. The one thing I'd push back against that, though, is the last time there was big gun legislation, which was the Brady Bill in the early 1990s, these forces were still present in the Senate. So I do struggle a little bit with this being the ultimate and only reason why we keep seeing this stalemate. Um, I think part of the debate keeps boiling down to what is actually effective. Um, for instance, you know, this was from a National Review editor arguing in Bloomberg, but saying that, you know, a lot of the measures that are put forward aren't necessarily effective. For instance, a lot of these background checks would have done little to stop um, shooters from obtaining the guns as they already had passed the background checks in place. And, you know, so there is that element of Americans often don't agree on what type of legislation should be put forward. But then I think, you know, in terms of the inaction, and it is an inaction that we increasingly see, you know, just from the Republican Party on this issue, you know, back in the day, there were more conservative Democrats um, in rural areas as well who would push on this. But it's just that, you know, on the issue of gun control, voters trust Republicans on this issue as much as they trust Democrats. A Pew Research Center poll from earlier this year found that 38% of Americans agreed with Republicans on gun policy compared to 37% who agreed with Democrats. I mean, that's essentially you see both parties as, okay, I kind of trust how they handle this. And so then I think, you know, and this was something that 
uh, you know, erstwhile 538 er Harry Enten argued at CNN, but it just doesn't give a lot of incentive for Republicans to act on this. There has been discussion um, on the Hill. They're currently on recess right now, but maybe pushing forward on red flag laws, which would stop um, someone like the shooter in Evalde, um, you know, to kind of put a flag on the, the purchase, given maybe some mental health issues at play. But it's just is something that time and again, you know, legislators don't necessarily want to push on because there isn't necessarily fallout from voters um, on inaction on this. Yeah, I was reviewing an article I wrote about um, this conundrum um, four years ago. And one of the studies that I looked at in that article had a really interesting finding about how people assign blame for shootings, basically. Um, And they found that gun owners were much less likely than people who don't own guns to say that mass shootings happen because of the availability of guns. Um, And, you know, people who own guns were more likely to um, assign responsibility to an issue like parenting. And so I think that's part of the issue, too, that people just are not on the same page about what is causing these shootings. And so, you know, it's hard to feel like there's a big public consensus. You know, maybe people kind of, again, like at a sort of intuitive surface level will say, you know, oh, sure, maybe there are some things we can do to prevent this from happening again. But, um, you know, in terms of actually getting to the root of the problem, there are some really fundamental disagreements among Americans about what's going on. And so it makes sense that there would be pretty fundamental disagreements about the solutions. And that makes it really hard to come up with a policy agenda that works for everyone. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, just think about some of the policy prescriptions that have been offered by the two parties on this. They couldn't be farther apart. You know, Republicans call for arming teachers. But then on the flip side, Democrats want to, I don't know, ban assault rifles, um, which clearly Republicans are not going to agree to. Uh, So (laughs) in a, you know, thinking about like the Senate again, a 50-50 Senate, and you have ideas that are, you know, worlds apart, basically, you know, two different worlds. Um, How do you find an agreement? And maybe it is on something small, like the, the red flag law, but it's, uh, you know, in terms of like seismic changes it are basically almost impossible to imagine happening. What was the context in which the Brady bill was passed that seems not replicable today? And also from a public opinion standpoint, you know, back in 1990, when Gallup started asking about whether or not Americans wanted stricter gun laws about the same or less strict, of Americans said they wanted stricter gun control laws. So what was going on in American life back in the first half of that decade that both, you know, Americans wanted stricter gun laws and ultimately got them in the Brady Bill? I mean, a big part of that was there was a lot of violent crime. Um, And just the levels of crime in this country were far higher uh, in the 1980s and into the early 1990s. Um, so I think the atmosphere from which people were talking about these sorts of issues um, and the fact that you could see, you know, such high levels of support for stricter gun laws, um, much higher than uh, we we even saw after, say, the Parkland shooting um, uh, in 2018 in Gallup, uh, sort of speaks to just – it was just a different environment and maybe it was easier to find some sort of bipartisan agreement, though I will mention, you know, Democrats did have full control – of Congress and the presidency uh, when they and had sizable majorities in both the House and the Senate uh, when they when when that was passed when the Brady Bill was passed so you know that's also something to keep in mind I think today sort of the go to boogeyman for Democrats on the issue of gun control is the NRA politicians on the left talk about it a lot from a is there a way to quantify how much this actually has to do with the NRA, like, is it actually this all-powerful organization that is preventing gun control laws from being passed? Or is it, because we haven't mentioned it so far, and we've mentioned, you know, other structural issues and partisan sorting and things like that. Where does the NRA come into this? It's a really interesting question, Galen. Um, And I'm not sure I know of a good way to 
quantify the impact. Curious if Sarah and Jeff have thoughts. But I certainly think the NRA is a key player in helping to create the environment we're in now where guns are such a partisan issue and where, in a sense, they don't need to play such a big role. I mean, if you're thinking about what was happening a couple decades ago, the NRA was playing a really instrumental role in trying to get candidates who supported their stance um, into office and sort of setting the agenda in terms of what was on the table for those candidates to support, what wasn't. Um, you know, the fact that we're not talking about them, I think, really just shows how embedded this has become in partisan culture. Um, so I think, you know, in a sense, like they're they're not the boogeyman that they were because they have been so successful at making this into an issue that politicians will just carry forward without them. Yeah, I think it's important to understand that the NRA is not a big spender uh, in terms of like political ads anymore. I mean, it's just like they, they it's not their spending that matters. Uh, it's the fact that there is a huge block of voters who have sort of taken on the positions that the NRA holds um, and are in many cases single issue voters almost in terms of their support for gun rights and opposition to stricter gun laws. Um, so I, you know, you still see candidates say like, I'm endorsed by the NRA because they know that's going to register with this very important block of voters, um, you know, that are mostly Republican leaning. Uh, and so it's not so much about the NRA, you know, running ads in favor of said candidate. Uh, it's about um, the NRA's positions having taken such a strong hold um, within the confines, mostly of the of the Republican Party today. Um, so in a way, the NRA has sort of already won. Now consider this stat from the Pew Research Center. This was a, a 2017 survey, but 74 percent of all gun owners in the U.S. agreed with the statement that their right to own a gun is essential to their sense of freedom. You know, if that like isn't three fourths essentially support um, for a messaging of, you know, rights to, you know, bearing a gun is essential to their freedom. If that's not a victory for the NRA, I'm not sure what is. And even, you know, we've talked about a lot of the the power this holds over Republican voters. Consider that until recently, someone like Senator Bernie Sanders, who hails from a small rural state, was in good standing with the NRA. Like a lot of America's relationship to guns, particularly rural America's relationship to guns, is a potent one, and it's a different one that a lot of legislators outside of rural areas don't understand fully. Wrapping up here, based on everything we've said, does it seem like this effort in the Senate to find some bipartisan agreement will be successful this time? I mean, how how would you rate it? Because it does seem like there's a group of Republicans and sort of Democratic counterparts who are taking this seriously and trying to actually pass a law instead of doing what the Senate has done plenty over the past you know year and a half, which is vote on something that is dead on arrival to sort of prove a political point that, oh, Republicans don't care. You know, this is what Democrats stand for. What's the likelihood of this compromise bill succeeding at this point? Oof, that's a dangerous, a dangerous question and bet. Um, I, I don't know is the answer. I mean, right now, Congress is on recess, so it's a little challenging to suss out how these conversations are going. I believe Schumer issued like a 10-day deadline. So essentially, once uh, senators return from the recess, they should have to essentially get ready for a vote on this. And the House has said that they will take up a vote on these red flag law that we were talking about earlier. I mean, the fact that Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell kind of gave his blessing on the bipartisan negotiations, that is a step in a positive direction that suggests that, um, you know, some legislation could come from this. He, you know, we've got Manchin and Cinema from the Democratic side as well, kind of helping lead to shape this. There are two power players as well there. Um, but, you know, I think we have to be skeptical of this ultimately leading into a law. You know, a paper from Harvard and UC UCLA researchers in 2019 found that mass shootings like the one in Evalde do solicit these large policy responses 
but they don't necessarily make it into law. Um, and that is something I think we have to remember here is even though there is kind of this groundswell movement, you are seeing bipartisan talks about it. It is a fragile 50-50 Senate, as Jeff was saying earlier. And you can imagine this also ultimately not being passed into law. At the end of the day, you have to get Joe Manchin on board and you have to get 10 Republican senators to vote for cloture. And I would just default to skepticism on that occurring. You know, Mitch McConnell can give his blessing, but Mitch McConnell has certainly made sort of statements of potential bipartisan support for something before, only to then not vote for it himself, you know? So I I would not put much, (laughs) I would not wager much on, on this actually happening. I mean, I don't want to rule it out, but I... I think we should, as Sarah said, be very skeptical. I mean, the place I would look um, where I would be more confident that maybe some laws will actually get passed is at the state level in Democratic-controlled states. And there has been a push in some of those, um, California, uh, New Jersey, New York, um, to pass stricter gun control laws. The interesting thing in the back drop of that is that we're waiting on a Supreme Court ruling that could call a bunch of different kinds of state-level gun control regulations into question. Um, It's not clear how the Supreme Court will rule on that, obviously, even if they rule in a way that um, gun rights opponents would like. They can do it very narrowly so that it wouldn't have a huge impact on other laws that are being passed right now, but they could also rule really broadly. And that's significant because we talk about, you know, what's happening at the federal level a lot, but really a lot of the movement on both sides of this issue, um, both making it easier to carry a gun and get a gun and making it harder has happened at the state level. And so it'll both be interesting to see what happens um, in Democratic-controlled states and Republican-controlled states uh, in the aftermath of this latest shooting, um, but then also whether the Supreme Court kind of throws a wrench into things for Democratic-controlled states that want to impose more gun control laws. And we will certainly follow up with you, Amelia, when we get that opinion. We're entering the period of the year where we expect a lot of rulings to come out. So we're going to have to scramble on a bunch of Monday mornings. I'm sure you're looking forward to that, Amelia. Let's leave this conversation here and move on to our debate over whether the narrative that Dems are in disarray is an accurate one. The idea that the Democratic Party is in over its head has been such a common narrative in the political media that the refrain, quote, Dems in disarray has become something of an online joke. It perhaps pokes fun at both the media and the party itself. As Democrats in Washington have struggled to pass legislation with their slim congressional majority, the narrative has again gained traction. Now we are entering a midterm election cycle that's projected to be bad for Democrats. On top of that, parties are usually in full support of their incumbent presidents, but there have already been whispers about candidates that could run in Biden's place in the next election. So Democrats seem to be in an odd spot, struggling with everything from pleasing the base to an unclear lineup for future candidates to fighting between the establishment and progressives to the prospect of being out of power in the Senate for years to come. So let's debate if all this is enough to say that Democrats are actually in disarray or if these are temporary hurdles that are being exaggerated. So we have a couple different angles from which we're going to address this question. But just to place a marker down before we get into some of the deeper analysis, I want to ask each of you uh, if you think that Dems are, in fact, in disarray. Sarah, why don't you kick us off? Ooh, I was hoping to have Jeffrey and Amelia go first so I could be the the voice of discontent if necessary. But yes, I think Democrats are in disarray. Um, I think our politics are one increasingly of sound bites and where the two parties stand on various cultural issues determine so much. And I think Democrats struggle to craft a message that appeals to voters. And I think we're going to touch on this in the discussion, but you know, I think something that we're still debating here too is, you know, After Biden won in 2020, it was a thin majority in Congress. It was an anti-Trump campaign. And there just hasn't been internal consensus on what governing looks like for Democrats. All right. Laying out the marker. Anyone want to agree or disagree? I mean, my view of this is sort of yes and no. 
Oh, come on, Jeffrey. Uh, no. Have it both ways. Well, no, I think it just sort of depends on what angle you're coming at it from. I, I think that Democrats are having trouble governing, but that that's not particularly weird in any way. Um, so maybe they're in disarray, but is it weird for that they're actually in disarray? No, not, not particularly, not with their incredibly slim majorities in Congress. Um, it's really difficult to govern when you need all 50 of your senators to agree on something. And then, you know, for things that aren't, uh, can't be passed via reconciliation to get also get 10 Republicans to come along uh, to vote for closure. Um, That's really hard. Uh, So, and, you know, even in the House, uh, they entered with, uh, what, 222 to 213 seat majority, which means, oh, you need basically all Democrats on board to pass pretty much anything in the House. Uh, So, that's really, really challenging um, to actually get anything done. And so is it really that weird that they are struggling? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, politics is in disarray for sure. I would say it depends on what you're talking about. So I will be another wishy-washy answer with Jeff. But let me explain before you start laughing at me, Galen. Um, So I think... Jeff is right about what's happening in Congress. Um, Democrats came in promising a lot with a very slim majority. I don't think it's weird that they're having trouble governing. I do think, though, to Sarah's point, there is a feeling of disarray about messaging and which of those goals they want to hang on to, given that they've had so much trouble getting their legislative agenda through and who they really want to be the standard bearer of the party. Um, I mean, this is something that has been a tension in the Democratic Party for a while. This is not new. You know, it was we had an incredibly diverse field of candidates for um, president in 2020. And then we ended up getting an old white guy. And, you know, there are clearly some within the Democratic Party who are not happy. And then there's sort of tensions about, do you run to the center? Do you try to run on sort of more progressive populist messages? I think that has less to do with what Democrats are actually accomplishing and more with the messages that they are bringing to voters. And I think in terms of the kind of, you know, campaign electoral politics side, they are in disarray. Um, On the legislative side, it just seems like Congress is broken. And I don't think like Democrats are unusually broken. Um, I wouldn't single them out for that. All right. So let's go sort of facet by facet here, because it sounds like you think that you can say that Dems are disarray in certain circumstances, but in others, no. And it sounds like you think maybe where Dems are doing the best is on, or at least not uniquely bad, is on legislating. <laughs> not so uniquely I bad. First review. That's what they should run on. <laughs> That's free advice um, for the Democratic Party. <laughs> well, let's let's review what the past year and a half or so has looked like from that perspective and maybe get a little more detailed. So they have passed the $2 trillion American Rescue Plan. They raised the debt ceiling, passed a budget, confirmed Katanji Brown-Jackson on mostly party-line votes. In a bipartisan fashion, they have passed a trillion-dollar infrastructure plan, aid to Ukraine, an anti-lynching bill, and reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. They have not passed their priorities on the environment, voting laws, taxes, immigration, social spending, the list goes on. Many things need 60 votes given the filibuster, but they could have gotten environmental, social spending, and taxes done with a bare majority if they had gotten Mansion and Cinema on board. So, Jeff and Amelia, it already seems like you said this is not a picture of disarray. This is a picture of Washington today and whatever things you might be able to say about their lack of ability to govern, it's about the political system. Sarah, do you agree with that? Because you were more on the side of Dems are in disarray. Like, does this look like a picture of uh, disarrayed behavior? I do think Jeffrey and Amelia have a point that what we are seeing play out in Congress now is not unique to Democrats. Like, lest we forget Republicans under Trump were trying to repeal the ACA, we know how that turned out. That didn't happen, right? A lot of times parties achieve a coalition, but when it comes to the act of governing, because it's messy, because it's hard, 
it doesn't go the way that they want it to, right? That said, though, I do think there is a central tension of Biden's administration that from out the gate, he was com- making comparisons or at least not playing down the comparisons to FDR and LBJ. He was not elected on this resounding mandate, though. He ran as a moderate, but then once he became in office, he has tried to govern from a more liberal point of view than what he sold to voters. And I think there is a disconnect there. There's a disconnect in the Democratic Party party. And ultimately, you know, the progressives and the moderates are kind of fighting at what that strategy should be for the future of the party. We need big, ambitious proposals, is the argument progressives make, to kind of win and keep voters happy. Moderates say, hey, you know, I come from a district that looks a lot different than yours. I'm not going to win re-election with these kind of things being passed into law. And Biden, I think, has tried to, you know, present to voters, hey, I'm Scranton Joe, but then has adopted a lot of what, you know, progressives in the party have talked about, but haven't actually gone into law because Manchin and Cinema have stopped that. I don't think there's one easy answer, but that doesn't speak to a party um, that has it figured out. And this is just kind of like Congress bickering as usual. I think there are real divides here that make governing really challenging. Well, I mean, I would actually maybe look at the Senate a different way, Sarah, because I think in some ways, given all of the kind of messaging tensions that you were talking about, which I think are really real, it's kind of surprising that it's only two senators that have been holding up these pieces of legislation. Um, I think there's you know, senators like, whispering in the background. I think yeah, there's a silent majority They're like willing of to be the faces of it, but... It, yeah. Right. But like the fact that there is not that the Democrats are more like they are publicly fairly united on some of these issues. I mean, I'm thinking about the the sort of symbolic vote that happened on um, abortion rights after the leaked opinion that suggested that a majority of Supreme Court justices might be about to turn overturn Roe. The Senate held this vote on abortion rights protections that was doomed to fail. Um, it was a 49 to 51 vote. And I mean, I think that's like like pretty remarkable considering, you know, where the Democratic Party used to be on abortion. Um, They've gotten much more coherent on that issue over the past decade or so. Um, So, yeah, I guess... I just feel like I think I I think I'm with Jeff, just that they're in a they're in a space where it's just hard to govern with a majority that slim. um, And the fact that there is not more public internal disagreement, you know, maybe it is just that, you know, some senators are willing to let Manchin and Cinema carve out this maverick path and be the face of the discontent within the party. But I think it's telling, given what you were talking about, Sarah, that more Democrats are not saying, I disagree with my party on this issue and trying to use that as a way to appeal to voters. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like this issue of, oh, it's not disarrayed behavior given the slim majority that Democrats have in the Senate and in the House for that matter. I mean, we'll get to that in a second, but perhaps the challenge that Democrats face in the Senate is a reason to believe that they might be in disarray, both today and going forward. But I'm going to leave that as a preview because we're going to get to it. I first want to focus on the midterms. So I think it's generally accepted that the party in control of the White House will lose congressional seats in the midterm elections. But does it look like Democrats are about to experience a red wave that is disproportional to what history suggests they should expect? You know, like, again, to repeat, is this um, exceptionally bad or just, you know, bad for Democrats, but par for the course? I would venture that it is not particularly disproportionate. You know, when an incumbent president has an approval rating in the low 40s or, you know, getting down to about 40 percent nearly in our in our tracker, that president's party tends to lose a lot of seats in the House, which is the only national election and is the thing that we should be working off of because the Senate only uh, only about a third of the Senate is up every cycle. So that makes it, it's not a truly national election the way the House is with all 435 seats. So, you know, uh, if Biden's approval rating is at 40, 41% come November 2022, and you told me that Democrats lost 45 seats, I'd be like, eh, all right, that that adds up. That's not weird at all. That makes perfect sense, in fact. 
Um, so I, you know, to me, it's like the way things are sort of tracking makes a lot of sense given where Biden is. And so much of this is about Biden and the state of, and sort of how voters view the state of the country at the moment. And the, the people who have bucked the, the midterm trend or or held back at only, you know, gotten only small losses, um, usually it's because their approval ratings in the 60s. Um, and so we definitely don't have that situation here. So, you know, I, you know Democrats losing a lot of seats would, would make perfect sense. This is going to become sort of like a chicken or egg conversation, but sort of saying like, oh, it's not disproportionately bad because Biden's approval rating is in the low 40s. And that's what you would expect from a president whose approval rating is in the low 40s. Is that performance from Biden disproportionately bad? Or is it like, okay, given the economy and given inflation and all these other things, yeah, that, you know, if you told me that this was the situation we were in and the year was 1985, I wouldn't bat an eye. Things are bad. Uh, For context, you know, yes, Republicans only have a 2.2 advantage right now in our generic ballot average, which asks voters, you know, if the election were held today, which party would you back? I'll just leave you with the nugget that this is the same point we were roughly in at 2010, and that was a red wave election. Yeah, I mean, the the generic ballot is a bit of a lagging indicator because, uh, you know, as those polls start becoming polls of likely voters, I I think the early likely voter polls we've seen so far would suggest that Republicans are probably going to be – if if it was all likely voter polls right now, Republicans would be up by more than two points in in all likelihood. Um, So – uh, you know, to me, it's like to your broader point, Galen. Uh, Biden does seem to be doing particularly bad, at least you know compared to, to more recent presidents. Um, you know, approval rating at you know forty forty one percent in a midterm year is is bad. I mean, I think he just recently dropped below where Trump was at about this point in twenty eighteen. I mean, we're talking very small numbers here in terms of the differences, but it's the point is like. Uh, yeah, he's he's doing poorly, and people are really worried about things like inflation. And I know we've talked about like inflation being something that tracks very closely with uh, or tracks pretty well um, with something like presidential approval. Um, you know, when it's when it goes up, uh, president presidential approval goes down, uh, and so people are worried about inflation, the state of the economy, and there's not really much to I guess grab hold of that's positive, and so that is also a challenge for Biden's administration and Democrats trying to run for re-election. It's like, what do you run on? Um, there are things that they could talk about, but it's tough. And and just the point Sarah was making earlier, I think Biden overpromised. Um, you know, he sort of, we've talked about this on the podcast, like he came in saying, I'm going to restore the country to normalcy, you know, and was like making these big comparisons to previous presidents that had passed sort of, you know, really transformative policies that have reshaped Americans' lives in really fundamental ways. Um, And, you know, I just think in retrospect, like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe he he felt like he had to do that to get elected. But how were they ever going to do that with the state of Congress? Um, so I guess again, it's like less. Like okay, for yeah, example, I mean, it's, politicians Trump do never over built promise a wall. and under deliver. <laughs> Right. But I think that's But he difference. never veered from the message of the wall. He mm. might not have built it, but it was the messaging, right? Democrats really struggle on messaging and particularly on culture war issues. And I do think that largely speaks to this divide in the party. You have one wing saying, hey, we have to go big. We have to be just as assertive as Republicans. And you have a more moderate wing who is arguing, hey, that's going to help me lose my election. And so as a result, the messaging is really muddled. Right. And that's where I think Democrats really are in disarray because they're not like there aren't sort of cohesive messages that they're trying to present to voters. Um, And, you know, there is a lot of disagreement about what's going to win them elections. And I think we're seeing that pretty clearly. There's been a lot of research on the idea that Democrats are more of a coalitional party and Republicans have been more ideological. And while I do think there is some evidence that Democrats have been trending in a more ideological direction as a party, they're still more coalitional than the Republican Party. And the Republican Party is um, just there's just more consistent ideologically across the board. Um, so in some ways, that may make it easier for them to reach a consensus, especially on, I think, like, 
axes, for instance. That's like super easy for them. It's like, let's cut them. Great. So a lot of this is going to be trying to draw historical comparisons. Understanding that the Democratic Party has been a coalitional party for decades, is this fight between the progressives and the moderates or the populists and the establishment, however you want to characterize that fight, is it more pitched than it has been previously? Um, is, you know, sort of, Amelia, you were saying that this is where you do think the, the Dems in disarray narrative fits. Sarah and Jeff, do you agree? Yes. So I think right now there is a fight not only among Democrats, but as the country as a whole about how do we talk about race as this country? And studies have shown, you know, this was again a piece that Alex Samuels wrote for the site back in 2020, and it was talking about why Biden is unlikely to kind of talk about race meaningfully anytime soon during his presidency. And that's because studies have found that when a lot of these progressive policies are pitched in terms of this is how it will help XYZ racial ethnic group, support for those policies decrease. And so it becomes this issue of, well, how then do you talk about, you know, universal pre-K and building climate change uh, initiatives that will help lift, um, you know, Black and Hispanic people in the U.S. out of poverty or help them more so than white Americans? That tends to bubble up resentments among white Americans. And as we've seen in this country, both under Trump's presidency and now, racial resentments and grievance politics hold a powerful sway. And I think there's this fight over, well, how do you talk about these issues in the Democratic Party? And it's alienating some voters, but then by not talking about these issues, is it alienating core parts of the Democratic base, Black voters, Latino voters, that they need to win elections? And there just isn't a strategy right now about how to talk about those issues. We're so far from where Obama was in 2008, kind of talking about a red America, a blue America, and it's all the same America. Like that message right now, which was a Democratic message, isn't one that you could see being used strategically now. If anything, arguably, the Republican Party is trying to use that now, saying America is not a racist country. And it's a question of like, well, what is it that is going to appeal most to voters when it comes to these issues? Yeah, I mean, I guess my sort of inclination is to be skeptical of sort of this being like a unique moment. (laughs) Political parties have had very sharp internal conflicts I mean, even, you know, we were talking about FDR earlier um, and how there were very poorly made comparisons that somehow Biden could be FDR, even though, you know, at one point, I think Democrats had like 75 seats in the U.S. Senate when FDR was president. So a little easier to govern in that situation. But it is true that there were also huge divides within the Democratic Party back then between sort of more liberal uh, sort of urban Democrats and then the Southern conservative Democrats. And, you know, they found common ground on certain things, but they were also, you know, it, there were, uh, there was a conservative coalition that was that, that later on that bandied uh, Republicans and conservative Democrats from the South together during like Reagan's presidency. Um, so like there have been big splits within parties before. I mean, hell, uh, most famously, maybe even the 1912 uh, progressive Republicans splitting from the conservative Republicans when Teddy Roosevelt challenged uh, uh, William Taft. Um, and then that literally spl- split a party in two um, and caused well, that's Democrats- diso- that qualifies as disarray. I would probably. say that is like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like dissolution <laughs> for a short bit, at least. I mean, they, they came back together by the 1916 election, but. You know, the point is that, like, parties have certainly struggled. I mean, I think Democrats, sort of in the aftermath of, like, the Voting Rights Act, uh, you ended up having, like, a conservative reaction. But I think there was a period where liberal Democrats were sort of challenging more conservative Democrats in the 60s. Um, And so, I don't know, to some extent, like, stuff like this has been going on. And even in 2010, the Tea Party, you know, the the rise of the Tea Party in 2010. Uh, So, I'm not sure it's a particularly distinct moment for the party, um, and it, at least in the, like, the grander scheme of internal fights within a party over what is the best direction for the party. We're going to have a lot more time to talk about the uh, 
specifics of the primary battles within the Democratic Party in the coming months. But I want to touch on just a couple more facets here before we wrap up the podcast today. I think some of the media commentary on Democrats being in disarray has begun to focus on not just these primaries, but the 2024 presidential election and the situation that Democrats appear to be in where Biden does not have necessarily the full support of his party for running for renomination. Um, and although he has said he plans to, it seems like a lot of people don't necessarily believe that he will ultimately. So, and we addressed this when we had our, you know, 2024 Democratic primary, presidential primary draft on this podcast. Is this a uniquely challenging situation that is that potentially sets the party up to be in a bad situation in two years? I would actually answer this somewhat yes, only because I do think Biden. So on the uh, Biden's old, we know this. He's the oldest president ever elected, and he's got he's old enough that I do think that there are real concerns with uh, among Democrats just purely on like the the age basis, you know. Um, and we have had. Uh, I mean, we have had a president in you know his 70s before Ronald Reagan was president. Um, and I was looking at some old polling on this, and it was we it's not weird actually to have a majority of Americans say like someone shouldn't run again. Like even for younger presidents, like I was looking, Bill Clinton was like a slight plurality said he shouldn't run in 1994 after the 94 midterm, you know, red wave. Um, but for me, the the difference here is that. Biden is particularly old, and it does seem like a lot of Democrats express skepticism about him running again. Now, I think that that could change the moment he officially announces he's running again. Like that, that could sort of pull people in. And I am going to sort of by default be skeptical that a challenger could actually take him out in like a Democratic primary. Like there would be some degree of sort of rallying around Biden. But at this vantage point, the fact that Biden is so old and if you're trying to sort of, you know, figure out where things are going to go two years from now, uh, it is a little bit different because he is so old. Well, and it's not just that he's old. Um, I mean, he's a, a white man who is representing an increasingly diverse party um, and he you know, I think he may not have intended to send this message quite so strongly during the Democratic primary, but he he really did kind of set himself up. Like, I think he used the phrase that he was a bridge to the next generation of Democratic candidates. And that, of course, is not him saying, I will not run in 2024. But I think some people sort of interpreted it that way, that he would be a one-term president who was sort of here to take Trump out and then would hand things off to the next generation. I mean, this was something that came up a lot in the Democratic primary. And the fact that he's also not super popular, that he wasn't able to deliver on all of these big promises. You know, I think if he had come in and been the bipartisan dealmaker that he held himself out to be when he was campaigning and he had, you know, maybe maybe the Democrats had somehow by some miracle been able to pass more of this legislation that they said they would be able to pass um, and they could be a little bit more coherent on messaging. You know, it, like the, the fact of who Biden is might not matter so much. Um, but, you know, I think there is a sense among some Democrats that they they really want a president who represents who they are and where they came from. And Joe Biden is not that. It's hard to it's hard to get past the age thing because it's like, you know, there just wasn't the same level of press reports around will Barack Obama run? Um, you know, will Bill Clinton run again even after the 94 shellacking? You know, will Carter run again? And Carter, of course, you know, had a primary challenge from Ted Kennedy, who was a senator at the time, but there was still not really this doubt that Carter would be renominated. And so I it is hard to kind of separate the age component from this for Biden. Again, I looked at some older polling. And normally, people expect a first-term president to run again, even if they might also say that that person shouldn't run again. You know, even even in the case of Ronald Reagan in 1982, and Republicans had a had a bad midterm in 1982. Most people still thought he was going to run again in 1984. Um, so the fact that you have polls showing you know majorities of Americans basically skeptical that he will run again um, is is that's a different. 
uh, it's different um, from from where we've been in the past. If he doesn't run again, is that an automatic notch on the belt of disarray, or could the party, you know, could he step aside and the party just has a normal open, you know, primary and remains competitive in the general? Or like, is that a okay? The floodgates are open. This is this is a whole big mess. I mean, you have to go back a very long time to find a president volunte- president voluntarily not seek a second term. Um, you know, I think it's what I mean. It, there's asterisks on a bunch of this because it's like Calvin Coolidge didn't run for a second term after being elected in 1924, but he had already served part of Warren Harding's term. Uh, you know, having come into office um, because of Harding's death as vice president. Um, so it's it's unusual for a president to not seek a second term. So in modern times, there would be no comparison. Um, but I'm not sure that that, that in, in and of itself isn't disarray, especially given what we are saying about Biden's age. But I think given what we saw in the 2020 Democratic presidential primary, you certainly are opening the door to a very combative wide open. I mean, look, Kamala Harris would run the vice president and she would probably be favored uh, based on what we know historically. Um, but it does seem like from a thousand think pieces out there that there are <laughs> there is some doubt about her uh, within democratic circles. Um, so I'm sure, you know, Pete Buttigieg would be right there to, to run um, and there might be some governors uh, who might consider running. And so it could be a very, very open competitive battle um, if Biden doesn't run. Um, so that could create the appearance of disarray, even if in some ways it wouldn't be that strange. But I think coming off of a president opting to not seek re-election would would maybe almost automatically veer into disarray territory sort of regardless. And so isn't there an argument that like the primary process is where parties are supposed to work all of these issues out? And if it's combative, like, is that really a bad thing? I think it's like how the process ends that matters because you could imagine Biden stepping aside, there being a really brutal primary, but then a candidate emerging who is able to, you know, unify the party in some way. So I think in, in the choice of like our disarray meter, which of those scenarios that you um, described, Galen, I think someone primarying Biden and having, you know, a really serious um, chance or multiple people trying to primary him, that strikes me as more disarray because I think it is less likely to end in a place where Democrats are happy with their candidate um, which is not to say that I think they would necessarily be happy with their candidate if if um, Biden stepped aside. But I do think that it's more about the outcome than the actual primary process. And, you know, maybe it's more healthy to have more competition in primaries. You know, this idea that, uh, you know, that that there should just be consensus from the beginning about who the party's standard bearer is. Like, I, I don't I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. No, I think Amelia makes a good point. I think, though, ultimately, like what really hurts Democrats is in this obsession around, you know, will Biden run? Biden's really old. It's like, is there a backup plan? Uh Uh-oh, like there's no backup plan. Like the image of chaos, I think, is already being painted, whereas like it's going to be an open Republican primary. It's going to be contested and ugly, but there's not really, understandably, because there's not an incumbent Republican president, there's not this same kind of obsession with like, are the Republicans, like, is their house in order? Whereas, like, I think right now, a lot of the media coverage, you know, it, you know, today, in fact, NBC News must have gotten, you know, wind of this podcast coming out, you know, it's like inside a Biden White House adrift. It's just like there is this prevailing narrative um, within the Biden White House, within the Democratic Party of just kind of like chaos and where does the party go? Yeah, so I 100% agree with the idea that if Biden actually had a serious primary challenge while seeking re-election, that that would be more sort of damaging and, and, and disorienting for a party. There's not really much recent precedent for that. Um, you know, you could talk about the 1992 Republican presidential primary with Pat Buchanan challenging George H.W. Bush, but Buchanan never really had any chance of actually winning that. Um, you have to go back to 1980, as Sarah mentioned earlier, um, with Ted Kennedy taking on Jimmy Carter. And 
uh, that actually there, you know, Kennedy actually had a path uh, to defeating Carter for the nomination. Um, so, uh, and and that was a, extremely destructive, I think, to the Democratic Party in a lot of ways. Um, so it's uh, you know at least in that short term, you know, it's to me, yes, the 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 Biden actually fending off a serious challenge is uh, is probably a more destructive scenario. We only have a few minutes left here, but the final sort of factor I wanted to bring up in all of this is how the Democratic coalition maps onto our structures of government, mainly the Senate, but of course you can talk about the Electoral College as well. You know, I don't know how that fits on a disarray meter, if that's exactly the adjective you would choose to describe it, but we've talked about sort of current legislative debates, the debates coming this primary, the debates coming the next presidential election, looking even longer term, maybe the next decade or so, does the situation that Democrats face with how their coalition maps onto the Senate sort of uh, an insurmountable challenge? I know that some analysts have looked at the situation and suggested that Republicans could have a filibuster-proof majority after the 2024 election and Democrats could be locked out of power in that chamber for years after that. Do you agree with that analysis? I mean, I, I think that that is not outside the realm of possibility. I mean, Democrats, you know, they're defending what Arizona, Georgia, and Nevada. Those can be really tough uh, for them to hold on in this cycle. And then you also have New Hampshire. And maybe if Republicans have a very good cycle, they could pick off a seat like Colorado. So there, uh, Democrats are down to 45. Then you look at the 2024 map, and there's what? West Virginia, Ohio. Uh, those are going to be really tough to defend. Montana, that's going to be really tough to defend. So there's three. So Democrats are down to 42. And then uh, there's Wisconsin and Arizona and Nevada and Michigan. You know, these are tough seats to, to defend. So I don't know, in, in a 2024 scenario, um, where, I don't know, Ron DeSantis is the Republican nominee and does particularly well or something, uh, wins by like four points nationally or three points nationally or something, that could be enough of a tide to give Republicans 60, 61 seats in the Senate. So yeah, I mean, this this is possible. I mean, you can, you can write that scenario out without having to make a dramatic leap. Yeah. And in fact, uh, Matt Iglesias Substack did write this scenario out earlier in April. And, you know, I, I did think the analysis, um, particularly for 2022, was smart. I think as we get into 2024, it just becomes so much harder to understand what the political environment then is going to look like. And at that point, he had said if Biden had won a state by less than 2 percent, that you know, the senator in that state is likely to lose. And that seems, you know, really to underestimate incumbency advantage um, and other factors that could be at play. And that's not to negate the fact that, you know, Tester and Manchin in particular, 2018 for both of them was like their closest uh, re-election uh, contest ever. So I don't mean to undermine that. But I think that could be true this cycle as well. You know, something that's really interesting for both Raphael Warnock and Mark Kelly in Arizona is the appeals that they're able to make to voters as incumbents, and are they able, even in states that are slightly Republican-leaning, able to pull out ahead in an environment that should favor Republicans? I think it is kind of maybe more of an open question than it is taken for granted. Well, and we've been talking about whether the Democrats are in disarray. You know, this also kind of assumes that Republicans are able to unite around a message that makes sense. And I've, t I've talked about abortion a lot because that is the only thing I'm thinking about right now. Um, but I think you could arg make the argument that Republicans are in a bit of disarray over what to do on abortion right now, because you see some very extreme bans um, that are on the horizon if Roe is overturned. And then, you know, you have governors of states like Arizona explicitly saying, like, that's not the direction we're going to go in our state, um, which I think is a signal that they are correctly seeing a full ban as something that would not be popular. You know, I think that's another question mark as well. Like Democrats are not in a vacuum here. And I think there's more focus on them because they have control of the federal government right now. Um, but Republicans will also have to make decisions about what they want to prioritize and what they want to say to voters. And there's always the possibility for missteps there, too. Yeah, this seems like a, a good moment to just bring in the fact that, uh, you know, once you start casting out ahead to the 2024 election, First of all, 
midterm election results and pre- the presidential election that follows have very little relationship to one another. Um, so, you know, if Democrats get just, you know, decked in the 2022 midterms and Republicans have a great one, that does not mean that Democrats are going to lose the 2024 election. You know, uh, that is just not how this works. And there would be a reaction by the electorate to uh, Republican control of the House, Republican control of the Senate, what sorts of things are going on at the state level. As I have said many times since the leaked opinion, I think the abortion situation is going to matter much more for 2024 than it does 2022, because midterm election is so much about the president and the president's party. And the presidential election is, you know, uh, a a head to head, you know, sort of each party uh, fighting it out um, with high levels of turnout, uh, you know, from both both sides of the aisle. Um, so for me, and also there just be more time for the the impact of such a prospective ruling to to actually be felt, and for things like you know more aggressive state bans being passed and sort of people reacting to that. You know, there's just so many variables that could affect the 2024 landscape that it's it's good to just be like, we don't really know how this is going to play out. We can we can we can say you know we can build scenarios out and talk about how things could play out, but there's just so many yeah. things that could happen. Someone should make a button that's like we don't know how this will play out that we can hit. <laughs> I mean, no, it's important to to keep the historical perspective in mind. When this podcast began in 2016, it felt like the Republican Party was in extreme disarray. By the end of 2016, it felt like the Democratic Party was in extreme disarray. Uh, you know, once again, after January 6th, it felt like the Republican Party was in extreme disarray. Now it feels like the Democratic Party is in disarray. So, uh, you know... There's a cycle to it all. I don't know if that's comforting at all for people, but uh, well, we're just all in disarray, Galen. <laughs> Chaos is the vibe. Maybe that's you know, yes. like yes. when you ask about what's in yes. disarray, it's yes. just like everything. Everything is chaos. All right. Well, let's leave it there then. Thank you so much for chatting with me today, Sarah, Amelia, and Jeff. Thanks, Galen. Thanks, y'all. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Chadwick Matlin is our editorial director. And Emily Vanesky is our intern. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Bye.